How fast can you go those first few days where there's no code? And someone comes to you and says, can you get a feature done? And you think, yes, you start writing code, code pours out of every orifice of your body and you get that feature working. And everybody goes, whoa, you got that working fast. It only took you a few days. Uh, we're programmers. Can you do it again? Yes. Come back to that team a year later. Can you get a feature working for us? Mm. Tricky. Probably going to take us six months. You used to be able to do that in a couple of days. Yeah, but you don't know. How messy this system has become. Why? If we touch even one line of code, all hell could break loose. Why'd that happen? Now, here's the thing that happens to software teams, right? They start out fast. They start out with a beautiful design, and they start out lovely, and they're fast, and they write features, and everything's working great. But they make a mess. Because they want to go fast. They make a mess. And as they make a mess, as the mess builds, the team gets slower and slower and slower until they bottom out at 1% of their original productivity. And this is what I got, right? I put this case statement in the front that trapped all the execution paths. I have a bunch of methods that look like this uh, that I created and added to the Gilded Rose class. And the rest of the tick method still contains that monstrous 43 line if statement, which I don't understand, but I no longer need, so I'm just going to delete it. It's gone. Now, if you don't have good tests, this may freak you out. And then, but then, if you feel freaked out by this and you don't have good tests, you, you're really making a choice here, right? If you have code that you don't understand and that you're afraid to change, you can keep it forever if you think that's a good idea, or you can put some kind of test on this around so that you can refactor. But keeping it forever is not really a good choice. So you want to get to the point where you have confidence that you can safely refactor, and then, you, and it means you never have to understand that code. You can do characterization tests around the edges. So that you'll have green, you'll have a wall at your back for tests, and then you can refactor your way to the point where you can delete the code that you don't understand. Short fiction has some really interesting um, creative crossovers and contradictions uh, with the world of software development. But you can always tap on it for a great series of quotes, because people write well. Um, one of the interesting challenges that we have uh, here, William Thackeray's quote, There are a thousand thoughts lying within a man that he does not know until he takes up the pen to write. This is the very situation we find ourselves when we try to plan a piece of software. When we sit down and say, I can conceive of the whole, I'm going to write this down, we're going to analyze and design, we're going to do it all up front. The minute you start writing, the world changes. You suddenly realize, ah, there's a different way of doing this. And if you don't realize it, because unlike most writing, software development is a team activity, somebody else will realize it. And it's normally for a person. So the other person will realize it. So this is one of the interesting things is that it doesn't matter how hard you think. There are several studies that try to quantify what's the impact of interruptions in our work as developers. And it seems that every time that we are interrupted, we waste between 10 and 50 times of time of 10 and 15 minutes to load back into our head the context of the task that we were doing before being interrupted. So to be efficient is paramount that we reduce the number of interruptions to a minimum. So that we have long periods of time where we can focus on the task at hand. There are basically two types of interruptions, the ones that you control and the ones that other people control. The ones that we control is probably the worst offender. If you think that little pop-up does nothing for your concentration, the truth is that for your brain, it looks more like this. Millions of years of evolution have made our brains very sensitive to any unexpected movement, mostly because of the fear of being hidden. So by the time that the pop-up disappears, you have read the subject, the sender, and your brain is already working on it. So the first habit of efficient developers is disable all notifications. And so not just email notifications, but all of them. In fact, you don't even want to see the number of unread notifications anywhere on your uh, on your screen. The only notification that you want to see, and see that one you want it on your face, is the one that tells you that you broke the bill. Now, um, I think email is amazing because it's asynchronous. You can deal with it in batches. Nobody expects that you will reply to it immediately, and you can choose when to handle it, when to be interrupted. In fact, I think we don't use email often enough. So I want to ask everybody that before going, uh, next time before going and interrupting one of your teammates, to think twice if you really, really need that answer right now. Because the same way you hate to be interrupted, other people also hate to be interrupted. So continuous delivery fundamentally is about making releases boring. We want software delivery to be a push button event that we can perform at any time, uh, including evenings and weekends. And it should be something that's very low risk and, and repeatable. And we can use it for all kinds of changes, whether those are networking changes, database changes, software releases, uh, any kind of change to our production systems or to the apps our users are running should be able to be done safely and quickly and sustainably. How do we do that? Well, it's actually hard, and there are a number of things that go into it. You can see there's 14 practices that uh, we have found in our research program to drive continuous delivery, um, from things like trunk-based development and continuous integration, right through to things like monitoring and observability and proactive notifications um, from production, things like database change management, how we maintain our code. Uh, there's actually a, a number of things that drive continuous delivery, so it's a, it's a pretty holistic picture. Um, these practices uh, together that comprise continuous delivery don't just drive improved performance and culture, they also lead to teams that are less burnt out, um, that 
experience less pain during the deployment process, and that see less rework. Um, and this is a nice proxy variable for quality. Um, what this means is by giving people the tools to build quality in, uh, they build a good quality work products that we find less defects in downstream, meaning that we have to do less rework because it wasn't done right the first time. How does it look when there's nothing there? One, some, and too many. And I think too many is absolutely perfect. It didn't really even need to be there, but that can help you pinpoint problems. And if you walk through your application, look at all the different places where there's an interaction, components, large or small, or where you associate data, too many is really, really telling. If we quantify things just quickly, let's say it's zero, one, maybe 10, 20, or 100 things, but what's too many? If you have a component and it can handle, you think the worst case is, oh, reasonably we'd never, we wouldn't have more than 500 things. But how does it handle 1,000, 2,000, even 10,000? Yeah, just looking through your applications and asking that question can help you pinpoint problems. But I think that the real like, big realization uh, you know, for me was that we really want to understand, like, like we went to one side of the trade-off with microservices. We said, yeah, great, small teams, everybody's moving fast. They're all releasing features super quickly. They're iterating, they're owning their own uptime, et cetera. That's all great. But sometimes you have to understand the whole, the whole service as one thing, as one top level working together as one giant machine system. And that is kind of hard when you spent all this time breaking it up. So we just got done, you know, decomposing it as much as possible. And now we have to like somehow like re, re understand that uh, all as one. This is a tricky problem, and uh, I, I wish that I had uh, spent more time kind of keeping that context together of like, we should really understand, we should still be able to understand the whole system working as one. We need to test our applications to balance this cost of making a mistake, cost of failing, cost of a single failure in our system, versus the cost of writing tests, maintaining them, keeping people in the loop, understanding the code over years, and we need to balance that out because it's all about the cost and we just need to take into account this whole probability to understand what it's worth and whether it's worth testing the application at all or maybe we should actually spend way more on the test in order to avoid much more serious issues afterwards. So that's the point of testing. So whenever I ask you, do we need tests, the answer is it depends. Some of those tests we definitely do need. Some of those tests we should definitely drop. Um, so uh, I used to work at Google and uh uh, Google, uh, as you might imagine, measures a lot of things. They also measure you know, uh, how their employees and other teams are performing, and they did a multi-year long study to try to figure out what differentiated the high-performing teams from the less high-performing teams. And it turns out that the biggest contributor to, uh, the biggest determiner of whether, of team success was not uh, how many PhDs were on the team, it was not how long the people had been at Google, uh, it was what's called psychological safety safety, or better, that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. In other words, I can bring my whole self to work. I'm not going to be made to feel bad. I'm not going to be made to feel ashamed. I can bring all my, my whole self, all my ideas, and I'm going to be respected as opposed to uh, made to feel bad. So I can bring my whole self to work without fear of negative consequences. And it turns out that at Google, uh, this was more important than any other factor in terms of team success. So that really, it, it really, uh, uh, shows the importance of culture. For, for me, the key idea was basically I could get my own types. And that's the idea that goes further into C++, where I can get uh, better types and more flexible types and more efficient types. But it's still the fundamental idea. When I want to write a program, I want to write it with my types. That is appropriate to my problem uh, and under the constraints that I'm under with hardware, software, environment, etc. And that, that's, that's the key idea. People picked up on the class hierarchies and the virtual functions and the inheritance and that was only part of it. It was an interesting and major part and still a major part in a lot of graphic stuff but it was not the most fundamental. It, it was when you wanted to relate one type to another, you don't want them all to be independent. The, the classical example is that you don't actually want to write a uh, city simulation with vehicles where you say, well, if it's a bicycle, uh, write the code for turning a bicycle to the left. If it's a normal car, turn right the normal car way. If it's a fire engine, turn right the fire engine way, da 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 You get these big case statements and bunches of if statements and such. Instead, you, you tell the, uh, the, the, the base class uh, that uh, that's the vehicle, so you turn, turn left the way you want to. 
The, the problem with operator overloading back when it was first implemented was that a lot of people in the C++ community then felt deeply victimized because there were a lot of people who would use operator load, overloading incredibly inappropriately. Is that there's only like a dozen operators that you can overload. And, and so if you want to do something that doesn't semantically match one of those dozen, over, dozen operators, right? So you're, you're used to thinking of, you know, less and less and greater than, greater than a shift operators. Okay, they're shift operators. And plus and minus mean add and subtract. They don't mean like list insert and list remove or output to file and input from file. So, um, and, and this probably is because of a, there was a large project at Sun that died horribly where people had gotten really, really out of control using operator overloading in wildly inappropriate ways. Um, and those people had knives and access to my office. Um, and, you know, so I was convinced that, yeah, well, until somebody came up with a better idea, you know, the, you know ways to, and, 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 I, and I still still have that issue with operator overloading. The, the, but the problem is that operator overloading is so freaking useful for things where it is appropriate that it sort of ought to be there. Guy Steele, in a sort of separate direction, did, did an operator overloading implementation, not on the, J, well, it's on the JVM, but he basically allowed any operator class character from all of Unicode to be operator overloaded. And the problem with that was that nobody could figure out what circle with a squiggle over top of it meant, right? You know, it's, it ends up being deeply in inscrutable. And, and so it's like, okay, so it makes a lot of sense for people who do math, um, which sometimes includes me, and I really like the idea of having operator overloading. Um, but uh, it, it, it just food fight after food fight. One of the things, and I, I mostly got this from my mentors who taught me programming language design in the earlier 80s. When you're teaching programming, the, the total newbie who has not coded before, in, not in any other language, a whole bunch of concepts in programming are very alien or sort of new and maybe very interesting, but also distracting and confusing. And there are many different things you have to learn. You have to, in a typical 13 week programming course, you have to, it's re like really learning to program from scratch. You have to cover algorithms, you have to cover data structures, you have to cover syntax, you have to cover variables, loops, functions, recursion, classes, expressions, operators. There are so many concepts. If you can spend a little less time having to worry about the syntax. The, the classic example was often, oh, the compiler complains every time I put a semicolon in the wrong place or I forget to put a semicolon. Uh, Python doesn't have semicolons in that sense, so you can't forget them. And you are also not misled into putting them where they don't belong because you don't learn about them in the first place. But there are bad problems in committees. It's inevitable because you get um, conflicts of personality and conflicts of style and, and sort of Deep, uh, deeply held beliefs that aren't fully unpacked into chains of reasoning. It's hard to reason together uh, if people come from really different uh, schools of thought. So we've learned how to cope with this by not rushing to any conclusion. When you're doing language design, you're solving many problems which... Sometimes you have to throw things out and start over again. That's happened, for instance, with uh, ES6 proxies. Uh, you have to avoid the temptation to say, well, I have developers that are solving this complex um, compound problem, so I'm just going to give them a complex compound solution that's kind of a fixed composite function, because that usually doesn't work. It's usually the case that when you decompose it, you find that you've got uncomposable parts. And what we'd rather do is what the scheme, scheme in the browser, the scheme uh, report says in its very first paragraph, it says, break the language down into orthogonal primitives that work well together. So that's been the job of the committee, and coming to an understanding of those primitives and minimizing the choice of keys. Estimates can be wildly wrong for very good reasons. Here was one that was a factor of six too, too small that I made, and that other one was a factor of 20 too large. Man, you're not, they're not going to be too easy. Managed to get that out to the customers. Now, what should an estimate be? What should an estimate look like? Estimates should have three characteristics. The first characteristic of an estimate is that it's honest. This is the hardest. The others are, are much less difficult compared to the honesty part. An estimate needs to be honest, which means that you have to be able to communicate bad news when the news is bad. Regardless of what your estimate is, if it's honest, you will breed trust. You will eliminate the problem that you are not trusted. You will not eliminate the problem that people get mad. You will not eliminate disappointment and heartache and the rending of clothes and ashes and sackcloth, but you will eliminate the distrust, and that's the most important of these. The second attribute of an estimate is that it must be accurate. But the word accurate is often misinterpreted. So, for example, if I were to say, oh yes, this task you need me to do, it will be done sometime between now and the heat death of the universe, this is accurate. It's not very precise. It's not very useful, but it's perfectly accurate. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if I held to that estimate, then no matter what I delivered it, I would not read distrust. So the third 
aspect of uncasting is that it must be precise. Not only accurate, but the, ends, the bounds must properly surround the end point, but the bounds must be brought in to be precise enough. So now, an estimate can often be too precise. If somebody were to say, well, when can you get this task done? And I were to say, I will get it done on January 23rd of 2017 at 2.13 in the morning. This is very precise. Probably dead wrong. Not very accurate. So what we're looking for here is the right mix or the right amount of precision. We need very close to 100% accuracy, but just the right amount of precision. And to get that precision, there's this fundamental truth that you first have to address. What is the most honest estimate you can make? I can make because you don't know. The problem with that estimate is that it has no accuracy and no precision. So now you have to add accuracy to it by setting bounds. You done sometime between these two dates. That has to be pretty good. And then you need to get it precise by bringing those dates in. The essential point here is that an estimate is never a date. It is always a date range. And you will find immense pressure upon you to make it a date, which you must reject. Because you know it is not a date. It is a range of dates. Now you are trying to do the impossible and become agile without any technical excellence. You're going to find you have a far harder proposition. You're going to run into exactly the same brick walls that people have been running into for decades. So people create this kind of view. They say, oh, there's feature work, there's technical work. These are two separate things. In fact, they create what is known as a false dichotomy. I used to run a bit, I used to run half marathons and 10Ks, and one of the things is, okay, either I'm going to train to run the race, or I'm going to try and eat well and sleep well. That's not a reasonable choice, that's not even a choice. That doesn't make any sense. You're being offered two things that, yeah, why would you talk about that? Feature work is technical work. There isn't something else, which tells us this most amazing revelation that many organizations are absolutely unaware of. Features are made of software. Now, I say that many organizations are unaware of it because it's like we can't prioritize doing technical work. Well, where do you think the business value comes from? Pixie dust? Is it magic? Do you sprinkle it on the code base? Or do you make features from software? If the answer is you make features from software, then you have to care about that because feature work is technical work. There isn't something else that is happening in the code base. You don't do feature work without doing technical work. Okay? So this is the most blindingly obvious observation. But when you recognize people have been presented without realizing a false dichotomy, they think they've been given a choice. There is no choice. A lot of times, a product expert, a product owner, whatever, brings you a project as if it's this work of art. Everything's neat, everything's in its place. It's really clean. It, they, they want to bring it to you, put it on your desk and say, that's the project we want, it's all defined, see you later. They think they've defined the belt. I think the project looks a little more like this. It's a different work of art. This indicates to me there's all kinds of stuff we're thinking about, and, but a lot of stuff we don't even recognize yet. And I think it's even worse that around the edges it's cloudy. And when we get near the edge, we go, oh man, there's a whole bunch of this over there, and down below, and up above. And we're surrounded by all these things we can never know up front. It's in the doing of the work that we can discover the work that we must do. We have to start doing stuff so we can expose reality. Let's find something to work on and try to deliver that. Often, what ends up happening is we do estimates so we can have the conversation about how long something might take and we want to learn more about it. But what's important is the criteria on which we base those estimates. I'm not looking for size or smallness. I'm looking for something I can work on. It has to have some kind of potential value. It has to be recognizable. It means like in that Jackson Pollock painting, I can see the different orange spots. Orange, this kind of indicating those things might be cohesive. Maybe those things should be brought together. Let's look at what that was. It needs to be understandable. Once we get something, I want to be able to understand it. If this is all the requirements on this project, I can't understand this whole project, but I can understand some small part of it. If I take that small part, I have something I maybe can get a chance to understand. If it's potentially valuable, let's just say, I recognize that part as being potentially valuable, and I'm talking with my customer, so yeah, that would be valuable for us to have. I can figure out what's cohesive, what belongs together, and what doesn't, and figure out which one of these do we want to work on first. And now I've gotten something quite a bit smaller, and I did no estimates. This is clearly smaller than what this was originally, and each one of these bits is smaller. This is now smaller, because we've taken out something to work on. I want it to be distinct. That to me means that it's very clearly a chunk. Uh, this is something that's distinct that I can decouple from the rest, and I want it to be cohesive. This stuff actually belongs together. If we're going to have five drop-down boxes, but two of them can be done as a pair, and the other three can be done separately, let's do the two first. What we've done is we've got something we can now decouple, work on, deliver into use, and determine what do we learn from this. What I like to see is that this requires no estimates, and when I find those qualities, I have something I can work on. And this gives us another cycle. That cycle is we do a little of this, we do the work on it so we can learn something from it, and on we go over and over. We're delivering from day one. I've worked on many projects now where we start delivering something of value in the first day or two, and we just kept adding bits to it. Precision is a matter of setting bounds. We need to say three things about the bounds. We make this assumption that everything goes right. Everything. For each task at the bottom of the work breakdown structure, you say, okay, everything goes right. Uh, every day you have the right breakfast cereal. There's never any traffic while driving to work throughout the entire project. No snowstorms. No, you never have a fight with your significant other during the entire time. When you get to work, the coffee is already ready. There are no meetings. Your coworkers are all polite because they had the right breakfast cereal too. And in that context, you estimate all of those tasks down at the bottom of the work breakdown structure. And you'll come up with some very small numbers. You take the best case and you say, well, yeah, it's the best case. And that means there's a 95% chance I'm going to miss it. 
Okay, but there's a five chance percent chance you might make it. So one in 20 times, you're gonna you're gonna make it. Most of the time you're gonna miss it. And then you do the opposite of that. You do the worst case analysis. In the worst case, everything goes wrong. Short of nuclear war, everything goes wrong. You are always in some kind of fight with your significant other. In fact, you're on the verge of some kind of divorce. Everyone on the team is on the verge of some kind of divorce. There are meetings every single day that last for 10 hours. And the goal of this estimate is to push the bound out so that you only have a 5% chance of missing it. So this is pretty far out there. And then you name the nominal case. And the nominal case was your original estimate. The original estimate was uh, that one down at the bottom. And you think it's probably wrong by a factor of two or three, but okay, fine. And you multiply that by your six before you do any of this, of course. And then you put that into here and you've got your worst case, and your best case, and your nominal case. And those are the three magic numbers that you want to talk to your management about. Architecture is about intent, the shape of the system, the way its components are organized, the dependencies between those components. It's about the intent of the system, not about what it's built around. Use cases are significant architectural elements. They are the things that tell us the intention of the system. So they are important architectural elements in the shape of our software. One of the biggest, biggest mistakes that programmers make is that they assert detail far too soon. Programmers are detail managers. Did you know that you were a detail manager? That's your job. Your job is to manage the most hideous details that anyone has ever managed ever before. How many of you within the last year have written an if statement that checks to see if a text file has lines that end in backslash R or backslash M? Who's written that if statement in the last couple of years? Now that's just the most hideous possible detail. But you and I have to deal with stuff like that. We deal with all the worst possible details. You and I are detail managers, but we make a mistake. We get ahead of ourselves. We assert the details too soon. We do say uh, that there are no rules um, in that you cannot go and buy a methodology, get a methodology, and treat that as being the way you write code, right? So, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to go down to my local shop and I'm going to buy a manual on, you know, how my company will develop code. And then I'm going to follow that manual and everything will be okay. Um, it's never going to work. And it's not going to work because all of these, quote, best practices are contextual. You know, it's only best in your team, right, working on your project at this time for your company, etc., etc. And what works in those circumstances probably won't work on the next project. You're going to have to adapt them. You're going to have to change them. And we see um, more and more uh, people who are being in this. And I think one of the big failures of the agility movement is that we didn't stop that happening in time. And so what's happening is a lot of people going around saying that, you know, oh, here's, here's Agile in a box. And you go and you spend $2 million with us and we'll give you the box and then you'll be Agile. And obviously that doesn't work. Refactoring is all about taking these very small um, semantics preserving changes. I always like to say that they're so small that they're not worth doing. But by stringing together a whole bunch of these very small changes, you can actually make a very big change. And that essential process of refactoring is very much the same. And indeed, many of the actual refactoring moves haven't really changed much in, in 20 years or so. Well, I mean, you need to refactor the code when, um, well, for various reasons. But I mean, I always find a clear indication of it is when you can't understand the code and you spend some time trying to puzzle out what some code is trying to do. Once you've puzzled it out and you've got some understanding. Um, it's, a, it's a phrase that um, Ward Cunningham used that I really like. He says, once you've developed some understanding in your head, you've got to take it out of your head and put it back into the code. So that next time you come through or next time somebody else comes through, they're able to read the code and understand it. Um, another trigger to refactoring is when you want to make a change and the existing code just isn't structured in a way that makes it easy to make that change. In which case, it's often faster and easier to refactor it to make it so it's structured easily and then make that change. Um, it's the, the phrase that Ken Beck says, I mean, first make, the, make it easy to change and then make the easy change. Um, and um, those are the kind of things that trigger refactoring for me, either when the code isn't clear enough to understand and I gain some understanding and I want to embed that into the code, or when I want to make a change and it's easier to, to put the new functionality in. There, there are a number of interesting things when it comes to bugs and fixes. The, the, the first thing is we have to be um, uh, tolerant of our humanity. In other words, we're not perfect. There will be bugs. Um, we are not going to be in a position, except for tiny fragments of code, we're not going to be in a position to be able to eliminate bugs. So we should recognize that up front. And so our goal is not bug elimination, it is reduction. Elimination sounds like 100% you know, of bugs have gone, there are no bugs left. Um, uh, so we should be tolerant of the fact that we make mistakes. We make mistakes from, from many different reasons. We have misunderstandings. Um, the very capability of understanding somebody is also laced with the fact that we might misunderstand them. You know, human beings, we are filled with possibilities. We 
imagine when somebody gives us a requirement or when somebody describes something, our skill is at being able to expand on that. So they don't have to tell us everything because otherwise they would be programming us. So that's our skill. We expand on that. But we also expand imperfectly. So some of our bugs are misunderstandings about requirements, misunderstanding about how an architecture works, but also we have moments of distraction uh, and flow and we make mistakes. That less than should have been a greater than. That kind of thing. The and should have been an or. All of these little things. So um, so first of all, we should give ourselves a little bit of space, but at the same time, we should also say, yeah, but bugs are a problem. They are a problem. We need to we need to find them and fix them, um, but we also need to work out how to do less of them. We can't necessarily eliminate them, but do less of them. Because a bug, a bug uh, is unpredictable. We don't know that it's there, and we don't know how long it's going to take to fix it. It could be five minutes, it could be five hours, it could be five days. It could be, as I know a couple of people have experienced, five months. And nobody put that in a plan. Nobody had that idea. So they have this high variability that is toxic to any kind of delivery process and is dangerous. It, it's, a, it's a huge, in one sense, it's a huge waste of time. Um, and of course, you know, we can't get rid of all of them, but what we can do is reduce the probability that they happen. So that's one thing. What is it that we can do that makes the probability of a bug less, um, uh, reduces that? The other thing, when we fix it, we need to recognize that there is a lesson to be learned there. That sometimes when people fix things, they are looking at just fixing the bug as it appears, rather than taking a step back and realizing this bug is a, this bug can teach me something. It can teach me something about how we work. It can teach me about something technical that myself or my colleagues did not know. Um, it can teach me about the time pressures um, or the priorities of my organization. Um, it can teach me that this bug might not be alone. We might have other examples of exactly this hidden in the code base. And just because they have not yet been discovered does not mean that they are not there. So one of the things you want to do is learn from that and say, well, hang on, where else could this have occurred? Instead of surprising ourselves in future, what can we do? So there's a kind of a learning idea and an improvement idea. We should, on the one hand, be kind to ourselves and recognize that we can have bugs. At the same time, we should also um, uh, guide ourselves and say, you know what? I'd rather not have this bug again. I don't want to spend my time hunting this down. That's not that's not what I'm here for. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe that is your job role. Uh, but for many people, when they look at a bug, it's a thing that gets in the way of their work. But because of that, they sometimes say, right, just going to get it done and be done with it, rather than looking at the broader implications. What is there we can learn? And does this happen elsewhere? How do I stop it happening again?